Dear students, dear professors, to all of you, I first wish to address a big thank you for coming tonight. It's really a great pleasure to see you all, and especially when you see the, the sun still shining outside and the, the nice weather. You, you made the right decision, believe me. As you may know, this even is the outcome of a collaboration between the Yakos Research Institutes and four students' organizations, the Circle and the Student Office of the Faculty of Political, Social and Economic Sciences, the new Association of Socio the sorry, the new Association of Socioanthropologists, and the General Students Assembly. Back in 2014, we first had the opportunity to welcome Saskia Sassen, uh, with whom we shared ideas about finance, global economy, and different alternatives. Then, Judit Butler came to express her views, especially about nonviolence. Last month, we had the chance to continue this collaboration with the Yakos Institute by taking part in a three days meeting with national and international researchers, teachers, and students. This meeting was about social change in contemporary societies, and that really was an inspiring and interesting moment. Today is the last key moment of this year, but of course not of the collaboration between the Yakos Institute, so the academics and the students. From our perspective, we believe that the transmission of knowledge is more than fundamental in our stu student life. We believe that spreading knowledge across generations and spaces is one of the central and um, central dynamics of critical thoughts and alternative proposals for a better world. We built together that series of conferences to focus on the study of a cross-cutting issue, the analysis of change in human societies. On behalf of the organizing committee, I think that we can say that it's an immense privilege to welcome Boaventura de Sousa Santos tonight. Um, professor of Sociology and Director of the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, Boaventura de Sousa Santos has been many times distinguished by famous awards, such as the degree of Doctor of Laws, Honoris Causa, from McGill University. Now, we'll try to briefly introduce you um, to Boaventura de Sousa Santos' work. Um, we've first been very impressed by the originality of his thoughts into the global academic landscape, and the articulation of these to his social and political commitments. The heart of his work is an excellent image of his desire to articulate academic knowledge and his implication in the global social movement, illustrated, for example, by his commitment into the World Social Forum in South America and Africa. This is the point that fits the most with the purpose of this kind of meeting. The question of the role of knowledge in social change is, as you all know, the philosophy of this cycle is of conference between academics and students. And more globally, the purpose of university according to us. Among others, his work revolves around the important concept of epistemicide in a globalization, which, if we don't misunderstand it, means the progressive destruction of the diversity of human systems of knowledge by the kind of colonialist attitude of the Western world through centuries but we warmly invite you to develop further and uh, make us aware of the complexity of your thoughts. Um, Boaventura de Sousa Santos is the author of a large range of books in the area of sociology of law, globalization, epistemology, human rights, and democracy. And his books have been published for a very large public around the world. Um, we are sure that the speech that um, you are gonna give tonight will shed some light on our question about all these topics. Uh, so now, Boaventura de Sousa Santos will give a lecture for about an hour, and then a debate will take place on the basis of your questions. Uh, just please don't forget to switch off your cell phones, and um, thank you for your attention, and have a good conference. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for such a wonderful introduction. And it's, it's real. I feel privileged by being invited by the students of these universities and in this way. So I, I thank you for the invitation and for the introduction. It's a great pleasure. And um, I'd like to share with you um, 
the topic of our conversation today is, is going to be a, uh, sound probably a little bit utopian, but I think that we are bound to be utopian when reality is so discouraging as it is now in many parts of the world. So I'd like to start my discussing with you some paradoxes of our time uh, that are underneath uh, um, the discussions, the political discussions very often, and uh, I think we should pay attention to this. One, one, we could start from uh, the first one. All of you are been familiar with the idea of crisis. Uh, crisis has been uh, from the Greek roots of the world is very much associated with the critical theory because it's through crisis that new possibilities are opened up and uh, new horizons uh, develop. But we live in a time in which crisis has changed its meaning in a very insidious way. It's a crisis that instead of opening doors, is closing doors. And the reason why this is happening is because of an insidious transformation that we have not noticed in most cases. Is that whenever there is a crisis in a system, the crisis has to be explained. In sociology, we say that the crisis is a dependent variable. It has to be explained. Why the crisis? But when the crisis becomes permanent, the crisis explains everything. The crisis ceases to be a dependent variable and becomes an independent variable. Today, for instance, we, Southern Europe, around the world, you cut in social expenses. We cut in welfare, we privatize health and education, and all these cuts are explained by the crisis. That is to say, the crisis which would used to be a patrimony of critical theory is now a patrimony of conventional, hegemonic knowledge. Politicians, conventional politicians, and uh, conventional social sciences keep talking about crisis, the multiplicity of crisis, energetic crisis, social crisis, economic, financial, and so on. But in spite of this, no new possibilities are open. There is a sense of exhaustion about possibilities. Leads us to the second paradox. Is there a world in which so much injustice is being committed? Just remember the fact as it was presented recently by the Oxfam, the 85 richest people in the world have as much wealth as the poor half of the world population, 3.5 billion people. That is to say, you put these 85 people in a double duck bus in London, and you have half of the wealth of the country there. What kind of a world is, is this? with this so shameless type of inequality that is being developed. So it looks like this is a world in urgent need of alternatives. And here is the paradox. Yet, it has never been so difficult to develop alternatives. That's our situation now. We may desire alternatives, but we don't see them. There was a time in which one could think, well, it's socialism, communism, whatever. But it looks like the agendas for social transformation are not there. So the political power has become much more authoritarian and arrogant. Because politics is about alternatives. If there are no alternatives, there is in fact no politics. In fact, politics is about alternatives and in order that the alternatives are played out within the democratic playing field, you have to look for the Abermasian consensus. So consensus has been very important for the liberal theory of democracy, for instance. But if there are no alternatives, governments don't need consensus. They need resignation. And you are living in a time in which in many, many countries, more people feel just resigned, resignation, not consensus. So this is again 
an idea that it seems that our world is leading for a kind of a light politics. That is to say, after all, there are no more conflicts anymore, even though it's so brutally unjust, our world. So I think that this paradox of the need for alternatives and the fact that we don't see any alternatives is one of the major problems of us, which leads us to the question of consensus versus resignation. But there is another paradox still, is that we live in a world run by images. Well, French sociologists have analyzed them everywhere, this analysis of images. And yet, it has never been so difficult to develop political imagination. How come that we live in a society with, run by images, but political imagination is out? The political imagination that would allow us to see credibly new visions of society, of a different world, another world possible, as the World Social Forum claims as its slogan. So why is that? That in fact, we live in a world in which because of the powerful images, there are of course imagination at the consumer society level, social imagination, but not political imagination. And the world is divided in two types of people. The people that have real needs and the people that have to imagine every time their needs in order to become real. That is to say, we have to imagine that we need the last version of the iPad and the iPhone, the last version of the program in your computer. You have to imagine a need before it commits, becomes real. But for many people in the world, most people in the world, they don't have this privilege. They are, they are alive today and they don't know whether they will be alive tomorrow. They feed their children today, but they don't know whether they'll be feeding them tomorrow. But this goes unheard by our major social and political thinking. So I see here a paradox, but there is another one that is also troubling. We cannot, today, uh, we cannot almost think about the, the, our societies without the concept of development. Why is this concept so important still today, even though it seems to be so bankrupt, intellectually, politically speaking? We have been uh, adjectivizing this concept of development in order to give it credibility sustainable development, human development, integral development, democratic development, but we are talking all the time about capitalist infinite development growth. It's everything with different adjectives. We speak of alternative development while we need alternatives to development. But it is very difficult to think of alternatives to development, even though if you really look at reality with, uh, you know, a different lens, the first thing that strikes you with this concept is that this concept could not be developed by a Tanzanian sociologist, by a Nairobian, by a Kenyan uh, sociologist, by a Bangladeshian sociologist. You could not invent as a central concept of sociology a concept in which most people in the world are in the wrong side of history. Because when the concept was developed, only a few countries were developed. Most of the countries were underdeveloped. Can we think of a concept in which most people in the world are always in the wrong side of history? That is to say, this is not their way of representing their own world, because why are they underdeveloped? Because there is development, of course. So development, in a sense, produces underdevelopment. Because we have a concept of linear time that tells us that all underdeveloped countries will one day reach development, even though we know that that has not happened. The world system theory tells us that it's so difficult that these changes occur. But we have now another paradox on top of it. 
is that in our theories, under development is the starting point, and development is a point of arrival. What we are witnessing today is that many countries are being underdeveloped. Look at Southern Europe. Underdeveloped, underdevelopment is not a point, a starting point, it's maybe a point of arrival. Look at Greece, look at Spain, look at Portugal, look at other countries. And this is going on in many other countries of the world, except that now in Europe it's more, more scandalous. How can we have a concept in which underdevelopment may be the point of arrival and not the starting point? And why should everyone be developed in the same way when we know that this will be impossible in ecological and other terms? So we live in a world that, in a sense, has all these paradoxes. And I think that these paradoxes need a radical diagnosis. And this radical di diagnosis needs a different epistemology. That is to say, other ways of knowing, other ways of constructing knowledge, and uh, of developing valid and rigorous knowledge for social transformation and social change. I've been claiming that uh, th since there are all these paradoxes, and the fact there is no, there's seemingly no alternative our current politics in Europe and in the world, we can see also in Latin America, we can see that in Africa. If there are no alternatives, politics become epistemological. Because the way things are run is because there is no alternative. After all, scientific knowledge tells us that there are no alternatives. And the alternatives that are there have to be run by science itself. So politics has become epistemological. And therefore we need, in order to have a different view of the current situation in the world, we have to do what I call an epistemological disruption, an interruption on these dominant epistemologies. And to develop different epistemologies, different ways of creating, developing, and validating kinds of knowledge. And these knowledges, in my view, that we really need is to develop knowledges that go against the monoculture of rigorous knowledge as scientific knowledge. All of us are scientists. We praise science. The problem with science is not, is not a valid knowledge, is that it, it's not the only valid knowledge. There are other valid knowledges in the world. But in fact, they are not considered rigorous in our ways of looking, our universities. We cannot bring uh, you know, peasant knowledge, indigenous knowledge into our classrooms, taught by indigenous leaders of, uh, leaders of social movements. It wouldn't make any sense. We are in scientific institutions. And therefore, we study science. And we know in epistemology, and I have dealt with that at length in my work, that even science is very plural, internally very plural. There is what we call internal pluralism of science, but there is also external pluralism. That is to say, most people in the world run their lives by other different kinds of knowledges that are not scientific knowledge. Why are not valid? Why are they not valid? If I want to go to the moon, I need scientific knowledge. If I want to preserve the biodiversity of Amazonian region, I need indigenous knowledge. See, for different purposes, I need different knowledges. But in fact, our dominant epistemologist tells us that these other knowledges are not rigorous enough, unless they are certified by science. So can we develop a dialogue between scientific knowledges and other knowledges? Not put aside, aside science, not, not, not eliminate it, but to try to develop what I call an ecology of knowledges, scientific knowledges and other knowledges that exist in society. And I'm going to give you several examples of these possibilities. But in order to do that, you have to really take further 
the idea of this uh, epistemological break is the idea that our dominant epistemologies are the epistemologies that tend to ratify the present, no matter how ugly it is. And therefore, in our universities, we tend to teach the knowledge, the history of the winners, as told by the winners. The losers of the social struggles rarely reach our universities. Our main, even in critical theory, is very difficult very often. We have to certify it as science in order to be valid. So I've been really, with uh, working with social movements, I've been developing the idea that of the epistemologies of the South, which is an epistemological South, it's not a geographical South. Uh, Australia is for me North, it's not South. Even though Australia has a South, which are the immigrants, undocumented migrant workers, and indigenous peoples. So the South is the systemic suffering imposed on populations by the three modes of domination in our time, capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And I think that uh, a new epistemological break that we need is something that develops knowledge is born in struggle. Knowledge is anchored in the experiences of people that have suffered systematically the injustices, the injustices of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And when we look at knowledge from this perspective, then you can see that our societies, in fact, commit very often the destruction of knowledge, what I call epistemicide. There are many knowledges. Well, it started with colonialism. We know today that indigenous people were knowledge bearers. And all the people in Africa have great traditions of knowledge. They have empires. They have states. They have the, all kinds of knowledges. But this knowledge was destroyed by the idea that Western-centric modern science was the only valid knowledge. So a massive epistemicide has been committed. It's very hard for us to accept this. But that's the truth. Or at least there is something that seems to me quite credible when I looked at the experience of the social movements today. There is the idea that there are all practices are practices of knowledge. People go around their lives, of course, knowing what they are doing. Maybe not a knowledge that I understand, Maybe completely different, as I'm going to give some examples. But why should we not consider these are other knowledges or knowledges otherwise that should be considered? Bring them into the conversation of the world. So the plea is for a broader picture of knowledges in our world, starting from the experiences of the oppressed, of the dominated, of the subjugated. How do we do that? The first move is to show that our modern Western-centric knowledge, which is valid in many ways, it's been valuable for many things, but it has, in fact, been very conducive to reproduce capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. And this is due to what I call an abyssal line that was developed from the colonial period onwards, which divided the world into the metropolitan societies and the colonial societies. And whatever is valid in metropolitan societies is not valid in the colonial societies. And whatever happens on the other side of the line in the colonial society is not relevant to disrupt the false universalism of the theories built on the basis of the experiences of the metropolitan societies. I'll give you an example. At the end of the 19th century, all of us, many people in Europe, for instance, celebrated the birth of labor law. Labor law as the protective law of workers. They were the weaker part in the capital labor 
relationship, and the labor law was developed to protect them, the weaker part, with lots of uh, subsidies, uh, compensatory laws, and regulations that try to balance the relationship between capital and labor. This was a major movement that we still live today, and is very important. But can we imagine that precisely at that time, in the colonial uh, uh, states, the colonial societies, which were by far the majority of the societies in the world, labor law was part of criminal law, it was forced labor, it was shibalo. The Africans know this term. It was forced labor. So the two pictures don't match. Because in the metropolitan societies, labor is protective. In the colonial societies, criminal law is a why is a way of disciplining the colonial subjects. The two pictures don't really match, and they don't really meet. Therefore, we can't even have theories that are oxymoronic. That is to say, they are contradictory. Take the concept of European universalism, of the Frankfurt School. This is an oxymoron. Because if it is universal, it's not European. If it is European, it's not universal. How this oxymoron has survived for so long? So when we start looking at this, and looking at what has been crushed on the other side of the line, we start seeing something different. But you tell me, look, this was the colonial period. Colonialism is over. Now there is no colonialism anymore, so the Abyssa line is not there. It is there. It's the idea that under conditions of Western modernity, under capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy, the concept of humanity is not conceivable without the concept of subhumans. Be they women, be they slaves, be they everyone that is uh, really reduced to a subhumanity status. And this Abyssa line is in, uh, sometimes it's very concrete. Sometimes are fences, walls. The wall that divides Palestine from Israel is an Abyssa line in concrete. The wall defenses of the southern border of the United States are very abyssal in this. The people on the other side are really subhuman. They can be shot, shot at any branch without any justification. They are killed every day. In Malila, in North Africa, we have also a fence to protect Europe from Africa. And the Mediterranean today is a cemetery of subhumanity. In Ferguson, in the United States, you, you probably are familiar with the shootings of young uh, African-American kids, which, for the most part, are incarcerated. What, where is the Abyssal line? Is that the policeman, the, the Abyssal line and the policeman in our world manages that the policeman knows without a shred of a doubt how to distinguish a law-abiding citizen from a dangerous, depraved subhuman. And this, you can see that on the spot. Because of the prejudices of ethnic cleansing, of the ethnic profiling that we do all the time in our lives, because of racism. Why there is racism? Because there is colonialism. And in fact, probably one of the most racist societies has produced one of the worst color, uh, racism of our time, South Africa. Can you imagine black on black racism today, as is happening in South Africa? Mozambican, Zimbabweans are being uh, set on fire by blacks because they are darker, because they are less developed. Black South Africans had been taught racism and are applying racism. So colonialism is very much with us. 
in sociabilities, in ways of life, in racism. We see that every day, and it changes time. We may be racist because the other is subhuman, is inferior, or because it's dangerous. Muslims are dangerous. Black people are inferior very often for these stereotypes. That's why we have to bring together the struggle against racism and against Islamophobia in Europe these days. So the abyssal line that uh, prevents people, certain people, from being fully human is a constant in our societies. So in order to think in positive abyssal terms, we need the epistemology of the South, is to try to see from the other side the people that have been suffering these injustices in alliance with them, and to try to see what kinds of knowledge emerges. And you can see that a lot of knowledge are emerging that are valid in different ways, but we have to see why they are valid in different ways. You have to have an epistemologist that accounts for that. So when you see that these are the sides that produce other kinds of knowledges, we have to do two moves. And these two moves are in my, the proposal that I've been presenting. The first one, they are subversive, both of them. The first one is called sociology of absences. Of course, it's subversive because no sociologist can do a sociology of something that does not exist. But what I'm saying is that these absences are people that are produced as absent. They are actively produced by absent. Indigenous people, for instance, were absent of critical theory, of Marxism, for instance. They have not existed. Can you imagine that in the United Nations, only one country said that they had black uh, indigenous peoples? Most people didn't recognize that they had indigenous populations. Indigenous were a residues of history. There was only one great Marxist that identified the indigenous peoples in the beginning and almost got killed because of that. He's a great Marxist from Peru, because of Carlos Mariategui. When he wrote a celebrated essay on Peruvian society, saying that the, the original scene of Latin America was to have been constructed without the indigenous and against the indigenous. Can you imagine that by that time, the leader of Comintern in Moscow, 1930s, came to Latin America to reprimand him and tell him, are you crazy? Indigenous people as a kind of revolutionary class, the workers are the revolutionary class. The indigenous people are residue of history. They have to be eliminated with progress. So the way in which you produce invisibility is very effective. Even today, there are lots of things that, many of the things that I'm going to tell you will say, well, it's not credible, it's not work for us. There is a colonial prejudice that prevents us from looking seriously at experiences otherwise, at knowledges otherwise, with the humility that the understanding of the world by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world. And our social sciences, in fact, have to be decolonized. Can we imagine that uh, wonderful authors, all of us have studied them and know them very well, Marx, Durkheim, Weber, and so on. Can we imagine that these people could think everything valid for all the world? They were addressing the problems of Europe at that time. We cannot blame them if they are not adequate to the realities of other countries, of other realities today. We have to work on them and go beyond them. In my classes, when I teach sociology, one of the founders of sociology is Ibn Khaldun. Probably nobody here has heard about Ibn Khaldun. I don't know how many, how many people have heard about Ibn Khaldun. Well, I'm not going to ask. But anyway. Ibn Khaldun is, is a founder He's one of the founders. He lived in the 14th century, 1332, Tunis. And do you know that the concept of social solidarity from Durkheim was taken from Ibn Khaldun? Asabia, 
Is the concept of Ibn Khaldun in Muqaddimah? Why Ibn Khaldun is not considered a founder of social sciences? Why is outside the canon? But once you leave the Muqaddimah, which is prolegomena to universal history, you see a fabulous anali modern analysis of society. It shows very clearly the decadence of the Arab world in the North Africa at the time. And he explains why. And if you read him, you understand what's going on in Libya. Because of what he calls the tribal democracy, which makes it impossible almost to have a state. But we don't consider even Khaldun as a kind of a founder. Because he's beyond, he's not with us. Even though this guy really knew a lot of the Western tradition as well that we consider. We consider Avicenna as, you know, Arab philosophers. They were the ones that brought to us Aristotle, for instance, Avicenna and Avrois. We're both Islamic people. But we don't consider them very well. But these guys knew him. He knew him very well, even Khaldun. And, of course, if I teach sociology in Rabat, I know that I have to include even Khaldun. But why not in Europe? Because what he says is relevant for Europe. So I think that there is a lot of work that we have to do in the sociology of absences, other knowledges, other ways of knowing. And once you develop that, and here where I come, is that in order to make credible alternatives to the world, you have to have an alternative kind of knowledge. Because when I start saying that there are no alternatives, there are no alternatives within our dominant frames of knowledge. Because if you go to the, the world today, to the suburbs of our cities, not, you have, do not have to go to Africa or South America or Latin America or whatever. People are struggling. They are doing things. They are creating alternatives, alternative economies. They, they have their own community sometimes, organizing by, their, by themselves as survival, as alternatives. So there are alternatives, but they are not made credible. So I don't think that we need alternatives. We need an alternative thinking of alternatives. So the epistemology of the South is an exercise to produce, to start producing collectively, because this is also an epistemological, you know, challenge how to produce collective knowledge. Because this is just my view of things that have to be developed with others. And many of them are not at the university. They're outside. Once you do this kind of sociology of absences, and you can start seeing these other realities, suppressed knowledges, non-relevant knowledges, but all of a sudden you see in a different color, you see in a different light, then we produce a second move, which is the sociology of emergencies. There's to see, you can see that uh, these realities may be meaningful for us. They are valid not just for those people, but they are valid for, for us, for the society in general. And these emergencies are very often suppressed by dominant knowledges. When we start the World Social Forum in 2001, trade unions did not participate. Because they said, well, the only important struggle is the trade union struggle, is capital labor. These struggles of indigenous people, of women, of peasants, you know, they are not important struggles. Why should we care about these struggles? The people that come from other religions, they come from other regions of the world. They are not important. And in fact, the movements themselves were very isolated. We had movements, indigenous people movements from Amazonia that lived 60 kilometers apart. They have been there for thousands of years. They met for the first time in Porto Alegre. They, had, they didn't know that the other existed next door. So once you start looking at this with other eyes, probably some emergencies can develop. I'm going to give you, so that you, you don't get the idea that uh, this is just a you know, kind of theoretical work that is not anchored in uh, 
the types of proposals that are being developed by the movements, I'm going to uh, work with you some proposals, some ideas that in a sense should be taken into consideration. I'm not saying that they are the solution. There are no solutions. At this point in time, we have to desire a better society before we define it. It is very difficult for us. In the modernist terms, we like to define everything. We like to predict everything. But there are different ways of imagining a better society. And we are not going to have an agreement on that. So we should start of plurality, of diversity of the world, and then to try to produce intercultural translation. It's very difficult, but the alternative to intercultural translation is a global civil war. And I think that we are entering in a period which is looking more and more as a global civil war. So what are the, the types of things that we are discussing? Well, these are things that uh, are anchored in the experiences of social movements, organizations spread all over the world. And uh, sometimes their alternatives are not even rendered in colonial languages. I'll give you three examples. The concept of Swaraj is a key concept in Gandhian sociology, I want to say. It's a deep sense of self-determination. It was absolutely central to the Gandhian movement. And it is good, probably for our world, we are going to see, it, but we cannot translate the Hindi word very well in self-determination. Concept of Ubuntu. Some of you have heard about this concept. It's from the southern part. Ubuntu is a philosophical concept of Zulu or Southern African type of philosophy. And there is a debate about African philosophy these days, which is a very important philosophy and a very important debate. If you go to this a project, it's called Alice, Alice in the Wonderland, a project that if you go to the, the page WW Alice, and you can see that I have a conversation with two philosophers from Africa with very opposing views. And I did that on purpose. The idea that there is a philosophy in Africa, so the philosophy is discussed in my project by two black people, two Africans. Because the idea for many is that philosophy is Greek, is European. The Africans may have cosmovisions, but they don't have philosophy. Philosophy is the Greek philosophy. And all the tradition that comes from there, which is an idea that came from a, the mid 19th century as we know it. And of course, we know that the Greek philosophers were much darker in their skin than we think they are in the statues that were built around them because of the influences of Egypt, of Alexandria, of Persia, in the beginning of Greek philosophy. So I take two philosophers, two good friends of mine, Valentin Mudimba from Congo, professor at Duke University, and Professor Mogob Ramosa from Pretoria. Two very different African philosophies. And one of them is about Ubuntu. What is Ubuntu in the Zulu land is a concept that means I am because you are. So there is no human being individual. That does not exist. In Africa, we have in many others, uh, in Ghana, for instance, in Akan, we don't have the concept of the I. That's why a great philosopher from Africa, Kibazi Biredu, wrote, I cannot translate into Wakan, I, I, I think therefore I am, the Cartesian principle. Because there are no words for that. Because the I is always I with. I'm not alone, I'm with. I am because you are. So this concept calls for a different ontology. There is to say a new way of being, being with others not being individually autonomous, because what are without? You are autonomous, but we are because other are. And therefore, you have an ontology which is much more complex than our ontology. 
Our ontology, we distinguish between the living and the dead. Right? Well, in Ubuntu, there are three living people. The living, the living dead, which are the ancestors, and the living not yet born. Can you imagine a complex ontology which is difficult for us to understand because it's so foreign to Western ways of thinking after Cartesian philosophy. But it's a different way of knowing, of conceptualizing humanity. And this probably anchored in concepts of reciprocity, of solidarity that are absent from our possessive individualism in the West. You see, but how can we have these three different kinds of living? Well, all the Catholics understand that the whole Holy Trinity, but it's nonsensical for everyone that is not Catholic. How can you have one God and there are three persons? It's nonsensical. But we are used to our nonsense. And that's why our nonsense seems natural. It's common sense. So try to think the same looking at Ubuntu, for instance. Well, this is just a conception of ontology. But we are talking about the visions that also render new ways of society. So one that has been very much talked about, and it is already in constitutions of, this, of, of Latin America, is the concept of summa causae. That is to say, we are so soaked up in the concepts of development that we cannot think our societies without the concept of development, almost impossible. But many people have been trying to develop ways of well-being without the concept of development. And one of them is now enshrined in the Constitution of Bolivia and Ecuador. Summa Camagna in the case of Bolivia, Summa Causa in the case of Ecuador. What is Summa Causa? It's a catch-all word that means good living, buen vivir. And this buen vivir is basically a way of existing together with nature, which is not the Cartesian nature, is Mother Earth, is the source of life. It's very difficult for us to understand nature in this way. So the Summa Causa starts with this idea that nature does not belong to us, we belong to nature. In the 90s, I was conducting a research project in Colombia. And uh, one of my research assistants came to me when she was an Arawak, an indigenous woman, a young student in law school, and came to my office crying. And I said, well, what happened to you? Elizabeth was a, a Western name. And so, well, I was in the, the class of uh, civil law at uh, law school, and professor was uh, explaining that we can buy and sell land and there are titles, individual titles, the property, movable things, immovable things, land is an immovable thing and you can buy and sell and so on. And I raised my hand and said, Professor, in my community, we cannot buy or sell land because land does not belong to us. We belong to the land. And Professor looked at her and said, well, here, I'm teaching the civil law. I don't care about your indigenous ways of knowing. She was so devastated by this uh, negation of a known knowledge that arrived to my office crying. And I said, Elizabeth, you are better than your professor because you are going to learn the civil law. It's very important that you learn because you want to be a lawyer and to defend your indigenous population and indigenous peoples but you also have your own indigenous law and your own knowledge. So we are going to have both knowledge at your disposal. This is precious. You keep, try to keep both because they are real antagonistic and they are going to be in conflict in your life. But you better acknowledge their conflict than you just imagine that there is no conflict because there is only civil law. Indigenous law is not part of the law. So, a way of understanding legality that is completely not Western. But the, how can we imagine that the only valid law in the world is the state law when most people in most countries are run by non-state laws in many ways? Traditional laws, community laws. 
We even have a concept for that, is legal pluralism, which now is enshrined in several constitutions. But summa causa, it's very interesting that the new concepts like Swaraj, like Ubuntu, like this one, we cannot render them in colonial languages. We have to, have, we have to use a non-colonial language. Why is that? It's because Summa Causae has a kind of a spiritual, spiritual connection between human beings and nature that Western knowledge cannot capture. We don't capture spirituality because we think that spirituality is religion. And it's not religion. It's a link, is the, the idea of the transcendent in the immanent. But our philosophy of subjectivity, from Kant to, to Hegel, distinguishes absolutely between the immanent and the transcendent. We don't see the links. Can we have a nature which is not the, a natural resource, but the Mother Earth, the source of life? Well, the Constitution of Ecuador says that uh, nature has rights, the rights of the Pachamama. Pachamama is a concept of Mother Earth, Mother Tierra. I'm not saying what the government is doing about these ideas. It's another story, of course. But it is there as a new way of looking at the world that can be captured by us, not by that government, but is part of the memory of the history of our, of our struggles today that we have the concept of the rights of the Pachamama, the rights of nature. What is this? Can nature have rights? When I was a consultant to the, the Constitution of Ecuador, I was in Monte Cristi, and one member of the opposition came to me and said, well, Professor Boaventura, you are, you know, learned, well-known European sociology and so on. Tell me something. These indigenous guys are crazy. They want to believe that nature has rights. How come? Nature is, uh, is this table, or the, you know, is land, is mining, but it's an object. How can an object have rights? And I said, yes, you're right. For you and for me, for the type of knowledge that we command is nonsensical. Nature is a, a natural resource. But this, this is not the nature that is in the Constitution is a different concept that we find all over Africa. Is the exceptional is the conception of the Cartesian concept of nature. It's not dominant because of the powers of capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. But many cultures go by the concept of what Mother Earth rather than by the concept of natural resource. And we develop an hybrid, which I think is a culturally uh, hybrid concept that allows for a different vision of ecology the rights of nature. Why this is an hybrid? Because, of course, within the indigenous philosophy, nature cannot have rights. Because nature is the giver of rights. It's the same thing as asking that, that or saying that God has rights. Nature is the rights giver, so he has not rights. But in order to make intelligible this idea of the rights of nature, they create an hybrid. Rights come from the Western culture, and nature comes from the Pachamam, from indigenous culture. And this is an hybrid, a cultural hybrid. And we are heading more and more for this reality, and you, you tell me, but you know, you know, it does not change the politics. It does not change today, but what is important is that our experience of the world is being enriched by these concepts. And they may be captured by other people other than those that put them on the Constitution. In last April, in fact, when I got sick in Quito and I couldn't come here, I was presiding over the ethical tribunal that, that we organized in Quito on the Yatsuni. Yatsuni is a major national park in Ecuador in which there was a decision there would be no uh, oil uh, drilling in that area because of the pollution and so on. But the government um, all of a sudden decided to exploit the, and explore the oil in that Yasuni. What we have there was a fabulous for me, a new way of understanding nature and the articulation of movements because this tribunal was organized by absolutely strange coalition of young, middle-class, 
people, students, most of them from Quito, don't speak Quechua. They have never been in the Amazonian region. They don't know anything about the indigenous cosmovision, but they are ecologists. And the concept of Pachamama resonates to them. So we had a coalition between indigenous people from the Amazonian and young people from Kit, urban people, ecologists, articulated in a struggle to defend a park, coming out of different cosmovisions and different attitudes, but united in the idea that probably nature is probably more Pachamama than a natural resource. So it's another way of looking at reality, which is very strange, but with time, probably, these things settle down a bit more. But there are other ways of looking at these visions. We are going to see in a moment. Well, I have to abbreviate some others. Because some these experiences, I'm telling you about experiences that are already in the political agenda. Ten years ago, there was no question about summa causa. Now there is a raging debate in many countries about summa causa, outside Ecuador or Bolivia, as a name for alternative to development. And we are going to see it in very most unlikely places. And I come to another concept of an, a new vision that is being developed here in Europe, degrowth, decrescita, decrescimiento. You probably are familiar with the concept of decroissance, the Serge Latouche. All this movement is a movement, the degrowth movement is coming from the West, is from the North, as a kind of a critique of capitalism, resonating with the ideas of eco-socialism or eco-feminism, for instance. They are the two ideas that are very much convergent with the idea of degrowth, which is another way of looking at capitalism from an angle that makes it impossible, because uh, capitalism does not exist without profit for the search of profit. Infinite accumulation, there is no other way. So degrowth, in a sense, is an anti-capitalist proposal, but has nothing to do originally with Bon Vivir, with Summa Causa. Serge Latouche and the people in the degrowth, they didn't even know about this when they developed the theory. But they converge, in a sense, in a critique of this unsustainable growth in which we are. And they try to develop a theory and a practice that today is capturing the imagination of movements in Europe. The movement of degrowth is already a social movement in many countries. It's minority groups. But you know, the seeds of transformation are there with a different concept. And there is another one, a fourth one, that I, I'd like to draw your attention to it, is the concept of the commons. In fact, the professor from this university has, has been a major defender of this concept in recent, the, uh, in recent years as the concept of the common good of humankind, is Professor Francois Outa. The idea there are some goods that cannot be privately owned, water, seeds, land. This should be common to people. We should decommodify these entities. We should not allow that the profit comes into these areas. And because the commons was very, was probably, we, we forget about this, but the commons was a key concept for the working class in the 19th century, Europe. Because the commons was part of a resistance against capitalism, against the enclosures. Because, you know, the, the commons were the common land, then they were enclosed, you know, they were fenced, so that they could raise the, 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 the sheep for the, for the wool industry. So the beginning of industrial revolution. So the enclosures was a destruction of the commons. So the idea of the commons, of the idea that community-based type of property was very prevalent. When you go to Africa, it's still today a very normal way of looking at land is communal land. And the World Bank is doing an enormous violence in Africa to try to develop individual titling of land, as they have done in Uganda and Rwanda, which is really almost crazy. 
because 97% of the Ugandan land is, is communal, and the World Bank comes and says, we have to have individual titles. How can you develop individual titles on something that is common? So you, you can see that not just in the theory, but in the practice of organizations, of movements, new concepts are evolving, new ideas are emerging, there are new visions, and they are convergent in some ways, but they are divergent in other ways. For instance, the degrowth is very, we can see, is anti-capitalist. Notice my basic idea that the three forms of domination work together. Capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy. We cannot separate them. Colonialism is not possible without patriarchy. Capitalism is not possible without colonialism. The commons and the degrowth are anti-capitalist, but they are not anti-colonial. Summa Causa and Ubuntu are more anti-colonial because they are the recovery of ways of knowing and understanding that were not completely crashed by Western colonialism. They stayed there as kind of new ideas that now become, are becoming important to us. Why? Because they are not just good for them. Why the rights of the Pachamama caught the imagination of the young kids of Quito and other parts of Latin America these days? Because it resonates with the ecological struggles. That is to say, it is good not for the indigenous people. It's good for the, for the humankind. The concept of Ubuntu is not good for Southern Africa. It's good for humanity to have a sense of solidarity, of reciprocity, of another way, and another way of resisting against possessive individualism. So this is a way of knowing in which we start to imagining different conceptions of a better society. Some will call them socialism. Others call them summa causa. Others will call it dignity. Why should we have just one language to define a better society? So this is uh, something that is uh, difficult to accept in our conception. But there are some concepts that have today have a kind of a credibility that they didn't have before. Let's take the concept of dignity. Because we have to do intercultural translation among different languages of dignity. When we were preparing for the first World Social Forum in Tunisia, it was the Arab Spring. So everybody wanted to go to Tunisia because it's the Arab Spring and this democratic transition. And after all, the Islamic people are so democratic and so on and so on. You know that. And the idea was, let's organize around human rights. Because it's basic, you know, all of us are in favor of human rights. Our North African colleagues in Tunisia told us, no, human rights is, we accept, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a language, it's a repertoire of a better society, but we don't accept it as the main topic of this. And many people in the social movements in the North could not understand that. Why? Because they didn't know that in 1798, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, he arrived in Alexandria with the ships and make a fabulous declaration. You have a summary of that declaration in my most recent book, just uh, If God Were a Human Rights Activist, it just came out. And what Napoleon says to the Egyptians is that they say they, that we are coming to invade you. No, we are coming to bring you the human rights. That's what it says, literally. And I bring the chronicle of an Egyptian guy that is watching the, the, the ships and makes a beautiful analysis, a counter-analysis of that narrative. This guy must be blasphemous. How can he say that it brings us something good when they are destroying our leaders, our ways of knowing? So many people got shocked by the idea that human rights may be a form of imperialism is not an unconditional human good. It's a contextual one. And has to compete with other languages of dignity. 
So we started a conversation, an intercultural translation, about a concept that would unite us. And the concept was dignity. Why? Because dignity appears several times in the Quran, to begin with. And secondly, dignity is absolutely crucial to the indigenous philosophies of the Andes. There are two key concepts for a better society in indigenous cosmovisions, which in fact is very similar to the African ones, respect and dignity. So we came up with the idea that the concept of dignity, understood in intercultural world, ways, could bring us together, while the concept of human rights would divide us. Can you see this? It's not to say that we are against, I'm an activist of human rights. But I have to know the limits of my struggle, because I have to say that human rights has been very often an emancipatory script, but also an oppressive script. It's not in the name of the human rights that we destroy the human rights of the others. It was not in the name of democracy that uh, all countries are being destroyed, in, from Iraq to Syria and to Libya. It's in the name of democracy that we destroy governments that we destroy human rights. We destroy life in the name of life. That's the Western way of what a great philosopher, Franz Sinkelamart, probably I've never heard of him, a Chilean, a German, but in fact living in Chile and now in, in Costa Rica. Sacrificial type of life, that we have to sacrifice life in order to defend life. And once you have the dominant powers of the world, this becomes very dangerous. And we look at the violence that is being committed in this way, and that's why we have the problem of migration in Europe. Of course, we are destroying the livelihoods of people. That's why they are rushing into Europe, because there is still some alternative to be alive. We are destroying the conditions of their staying in their own countries. So I think that if we take a look about around these ideas, you can see that probably if you are a little bit more humble and look at the experiences and don't make them ridiculed, you have to try to understand alternative ways of being credible. And to try to understand, because if you are in a conversation with others on an horizontal basis, you have to allow for things that are not intelligible to you. Because we cannot translate everything. The most important things in any culture are untranslatable. They are the taboos of a given culture. They cannot even be pronounced in some ways. In Islam, it's very clearly, in Christianity as well. There are things that we don't give up. We don't go into translating everything. But we can translate as much as is necessary to articulate struggles. And I think that what I'm proposing to you as the new visions is these alternative repertoires of a better society that are emerging in different parts of the world. They have something in common. They have an impulse to democratize in a global sense. Sometimes they took experience from the West, reappropriate them, and bring them a different color or a different style. Take the Constitution of Bolivia. There are three kinds of democracy enshrined in the Constitution of Bolivia. Representative democracy, participatory democracy, communitarian democracy. I have done all my studies in Brazil on participatory democracy, participatory budgeting, for instance. But I never thought of the possibilities of having three kinds of democracy. Communitarian democracy which is by consensus or by rotation, for instance. But this form that seems too strange to you, this communitarian, is a form of democracy that you find now in British Columbia, in Vancouver, in which citizens are chosen by lottery to run some parts of the municipality. And the commons is not necessarily an old thing. What is the Wikipedia? The Wikipedia is a commons. Is a digital commons. So there are things that may be very old, but they are not part of our past. 
They are part of our future. I don't have any romantic view of these ideas. I have seen many corrupt leaders everywhere of movements and organizations. Romantic views are for the people that are outside these movements. Inside we see the misery of humankind. But in the midst of the impure struggles, because all these struggles are impure, there are no pure struggles, you can see these emergencies. Sometimes I call them living ruins. Because for it, when we look at Summa Causa, it looks like a living ruin, something that the, the Western colonialism didn't manage to eliminate completely. It stayed in the memory of people. But the memory that interests us from a critical point of view is a memory that is anticipation. Memory does not suffice. It's memory and anticipation. So I think that if we broaden the conversation of the humankind, you see these visions, you see these ideas, they are not probably very credible. They are being destroyed by neoliberalism. These days we see in Latin America, on one side, summa causa, on the other side, the extractivism that is destroying the indigenous communities. The progressive movement, governments of uh, call, considered progressive because of social redistribution, etc., etc., are destroying all these uh, Pachamama. So the contradiction is there. The problem is that the rights of the Pachamama are part of our patrimony now. They are not patrimony of Ecuador or Bolivia. They are part of the struggles for a better society. And therefore, they may be used in other context. And this is the amplification, symbolic amplification. What is an emergence? An emergence is whatever is necessary that manifests itself as possible. The necessary that manifests itself as possible. That's what I consider to be the emergent. Emergent in these embryonic forms of new ways of looking at reality that are looking for two questions and uh, five minutes on these two questions and I end, which are the crucial questions after all. Is the question of political agency and the question of transition. We cannot move to other new visions without transitions. If 60% of the budget of Ecuador is based on oil, how can I do summa causa? I have to allow for a period of transition in which I move to a different economy. But I can't do that from one day to the next. The same debate in many other countries, throughout Africa, for instance, in Mozambique, which I, in which I work, which is going to be ravaged by land grabbing at this point. Privatization of land, even though it's communal, but the state is selling the leases for 19, 19 years, and the land is being bought by the Brazilian, by the Chinese, by the South Koreans for food, you know, in Ethiopia, in Somalia. They are buying land, tracts of land. In Madagascar, they almost bought half of the land for food reserves, but for their own people. Saudi Arabia, not for the Africans, of course. This is what we call land grabbing. So these situations violate everything that I said, but that's part of the struggle. The struggle is this, is between the most antisocial form of capitalism that ever existed, in my view, which is this neoliberal financial capital driven type of capitalism, and these are the alternatives that are emerging in many different ways. And we can say, well, there is no alternative. We become cynical. If you can afford to be cynical, you be cynical. But most people in the world cannot afford to be cynical. Because, as I said, they are feeding their children today, but they don't know if they will be enough food next tomorrow. So they cannot afford to be cynical. So that's why some theories of the cynic theory that we have today in Europe are absolutely insulting for the people in the world. Even the concept of the degrowth. I can speak here with you about it, but I can't take it to the Africa. What is the obvious answer if I come with the concept of degrowth? Said, what, what, are you crazy? So you have been growing in Europe and North America, and now you are telling us to be degrowing? De de what is that? So degrowth is a Western-centric proposal that is anti-systemic but cannot be global. 
it is a way, and I'm not going to discredit it, but it has to be converged in kinds of alliances with other languages that are not insulting, like the concept of dignity or others. They want me to conclude, 10 minutes? No, I don't need 10 minutes. And the pastor debate, oh, you are very generous, 10 minutes, my God, I, don't, I said five. And I'm going to finish with this. Because that's the, the, the first question is the question of, Asia, of, of transition. The second one is the question of power and political agency. Do we have political actors to conduct these types of new visions? That's the real open question today. And in our political science, we have all kinds of limitations for this. And you know why? Because we always believed that in order to be political subjects, people have to organize. So they are organizing parties and social movements. We forgot that probably most part of the people are not members of parties or members of social movements. And we consider these people are depoliticized. These are the people that are filling the streets of Europe these days, the indignados and the Occupy. They were the ones that we consider to be depoliticized. So I think that we need to discover other forms of agency. Parties are important, but they have to be pre-founded. Podemos in Spain is a good example of things that may be politically done in a different way. That is to say, to develop participatory democracy within a given party, in which circles of citizens produce the policies of the parties. We are going to need the social movements, but I think that we have to go beyond this. That's what I call the collective presences. Because these demonstrations, the people, the indignados, that will come again, I'm sure, they are collective presences. They are good to protest, but they are not good to, to do political formulation. We need other agencies, other instruments to do political formulation. And that's why Podemos comes from the indignados, from a fraction of the indignados movement. And Syriza, in a given way, in a certain way, in, in Greece, is the same. So we need other forms of political agency. But there is, and this is my final question or idea, is that the diversity of uh, the alternatives in our time are leading to a situation which, as a sociologist, I find very compelling and interesting, even though it goes against all my tradition, intellectual tradition, so to say, is that on one side we have the people that think that we have to take over power. They used to say, we have to take the state, we have to take power. The Zapatistas came with the idea, almost the opposing idea, you know, transform the world without taking power. John Holloway spoke, the Zapatistas, John Holloway is a better interpretation of Zapatista, but this is a different way, it's a different question. But there are today, I think that we cannot afford to be, to work within the state or outside the state. We are going to enter a period in which we'll be conducting struggles outside the state and inside the state. Some of them are going to be institutional, others are going to take place uh, in the streets. As I plea, peacefully, that's my Gandhian, probably, stream of thinking. But they are going to be post-institutional. We are going to enter a period of institutional turbulence in Europe and elsewhere. Because the institutions are there, but they've been hijacked by non-democrats. Today, the United States is not a democracy. It's a kleptocracy and a plutocracy. Because money runs those countries. All the governments. And that's why democracy is being hollowed out. And that's why I think that we are living, entering a period in which societies are politically democratic, but socially fascistic. More and more people are depending on charity on the givers of these billionaires that give you for that cause and for that cause. And they are not obliged to do so. They do if they want. There are no universal rights. There is philanthropy. Remember the 19th century. The development of underdevelopment. It looks like we are going back, but we are never going back. 
probably it's not linear, but it's pure spiral. So the proposal that I bring to you is that expand the conversation, start from the idea that the understanding of the world is by far exceeds the Western understanding of the world, and therefore social transformation may take paths that we cannot have not predicted within the Western-centric type of repertoires or narratives, may take other views. And some of them may be dangerous, and we have to take risks. We live in societies of uninsurable risks. And that's why it is impossible to name the future society. That's why the World Social Forum says another world is possible, because we cannot define it. The problem, which in my, in my view is the solution, is that we have to desire another world, even if we don't know exactly how, is, how it is going to be. Because if you knew, then there is a recipe. Then you are going to leave out people that don't believe. And we need to bring together in these forms of articulation, be they with peasants and women and urban movements and so on. All my work now is trying to unite these movements. And that's the concluding remark is this. Last week, two weeks ago, in, in, uh, in Tunisia, we were in a meeting of the Via Campesina. The struggle is against transgenic seeds. As you know, they are going to be present in Europe because the European Union is trying to, if we'll introduce transgenic seeds in Europe, not on an experimental basis as it is now, but as a common basis. Well, the transgenic seeds is a wonderful struggle, as an important struggle to create articulations with two types of movements. Consumer movement, because transgenic seeds is going to produce unhealthy food and health problems. So people that are concerned with right to health, people that are concerned with consumer rights, can very well unite with the struggle of peasants for Creole or indigenous seeds. And these type of alliances, which are so difficult to develop, is the only alternative to the global civil war. Because in reality, capitalism united, the oppressed by capitalism and colonialism are more and more divided. And something has to be done. And uh, if it is not the global civil war, it's something around these ideas that I just put forward to you for a debate. Thank you.